morning, friends. Yeah. Reading this morning from Philippians chapter 4. And this is Paul exhorting his congregation. Verse, um, chapter 4, verse 4 to 8. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And Lord, we pray that Barry's message this morning will enforce these things in our lives. I've, um, w when Nick asked me on Friday, when Nick said, uh, when, he, when he asked me to preach, um, I really didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, so I dug out an old sermon. Uh, who was here in 2006? Okay, so you people will have to forgive me if you remember all the minute detail of what you're about to hear. Um, however, I have updated what I prepared at that stage. I'm the reluctant preacher and uh, people would perhaps be critical of me for that reason. But actually, if you look in the Bible, you find out there's an, quite a number of people, biblical characters, who were very reluctant, who didn't want to sort of put themselves out there. And perhaps you can think of some. Would you like to name one that you can remember? Yep. Yep. Jonah, yep. Moses, yep. Jeremiah, yeah, and uh, yes, there's so many. Uh, they were reluctant. They didn't want to be the front person. And I was thinking about Peter. Uh, Peter was a humble fisherman raised up by God, and he did some pretty, pretty poor things in his life. He denied Jesus three times, and... Even though he did that, Jesus lifted him up and forgave him and made him into a very special person. And I'm always impressed when I read in uh, the book of Acts where Peter stands up in front of the crowd and he begins to talk to them. And the Holy Spirit comes upon him in a very powerful way and thousands of people came to the Lord through this humble fisherman and that was not Peter that was the Holy Spirit um, rejoice in the Lord always I'll say it again rejoice let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I'll stop there. This for me is one of the most meaningful and practical passages that I have encountered in the Bible. And this morning I want to unpack it for you. Paul is writing to the church in Philippi, to the Philippians. And it's a short letter of thanks, thanking them for a gift that they have given, um, that he received while he was a prisoner in Rome. Now some call this the letter of joy because joy is spoken of 16 times in this letter. Some time ago, 
I was part of a home group and we were studying joy. So this particular book of Philippians kept cropping up. And if you haven't read it recently, may I encourage you to do so. In fact, if you haven't read the Bible recently, that's a good idea too. Rejoice. It says rejoice twice, not once. So it must be quite important. Why are we encouraged to be joyful? Well, being joyful, being glad, is a displaying a positive mental attitude. And boy, do we need that sometimes. There are many secular books written on the importance of this, but the Bible also repeatedly speaks of the value of positive thinking. Of being joyful, we are surrounded by media that is trying to do the opposite. And we have to recognize that. We are bombarded by bad news. But we know that there is good news. Wonderful good news. What sort of personality do you think Jesus had? Well, he clearly attracted people to him by the thousands. Clearly he was enthusiastic, charismatic, compassionate, understanding and loving. But he was also filled with joy. I suspect that he loved a good joke. I also imagine he laughed a lot. John Chapter 15, verse 11 says the, the, this, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may remain in you and your joy may be full. Your joy may be full. He wants us to be full of gladness. He doesn't want us to be doom and gloom people because they're not very attractive. He wants us to be fun and to have fun. To be with joyful people is to be uplifted. And we're attracted to them. Obviously, we're all different. We can't all be happy, clappy people. Um, and God made us that way. That's okay. We're all different. Celebrate it. It's clear that our Heavenly Father wants us to be positive, however, and we are to follow the example of Jesus in doing that. So we're told twice, delight in the Lord. If we are joyful, it's good for our health. It's good for your mental health. We need that too. Some of us need it more than others. It has therapeutic value. Laughter is good for you. Did you know... Laughter, yes. Did you know that laughter boosts your immune system, reduces your susceptibility to allergens, makes you less susceptible to heart attack, lowers your blood pressure, combats cancer, promotes health and healing. So this Bible passage knew what it was talking about. Good, healthy stuff. We need a healthy dose each day of joy. So we should seek ways to generate laughter. Laughter and joy are really good medicine. Many in the Verses in the Bible back this up, and I'm sure you can recall some. The Psalms are full of examples, lots of singing, lots of dancing, even hills clapping their hands. Never understood that, but <laughs> hills clapping their hands. I'm going to take you to a personal experience now, um, kind of a midlife crisis 
actually no, maybe end of life crisis. Um, I sold my little fishing boat recently. Yeah, it was an ah moment. And I, I felt, I wasn't using it very much, but when it went, I felt sad. At certain times in your life, you recognize that perhaps this is the last time you'll do something or the last time you'll go somewhere or the last time you'll see somebody. I had that feeling about my boat. You see, I've had boats ever since I was a boy. I can remember as a 13-year-old coming to live in New Zealand, going down to the beach in Howick with my brother. We looked out, coming from London, if you can imagine, different life. Beach in Howick, looking out to sea, there's all these sailing boats. I looked at my brother. We've got to get one of those. And that was our first boat. And we had years of fun sailing together. Anyway, I had a sudden experience after selling that boat. What have I done in my life what have I experienced in my life that has given me some of the greatest joy and fun? Well, it is sailing at high speed in a small sailing boat on the edge of control. Roger, I'm gonna take, get you to take this photograph around and uh, it shows me doing exactly that and it was published in a um, Boating magazine back in the 70s. Okay, now having realized that I get so much fun out of sailing, I started looking on Trade Me for something that could help me with this. Something that I could still manage. When you see that picture, you can perhaps picture I can't manage that anymore. Um, I'm no longer a boy. So what I did was I started searching on Trade Me and I found something that I could manage that would still give me that fun. Bring up the picture of what I bought. Okay, that's, that's where, that's my fun boat. If anyone would like to go sailing, I have space. <laughs> I mean that seriously, if you've got a, a son, daughter, grandchild who'd like to go out sailing, there's room for more than one. We all need fun and joy. Never give up on doing what delights you. And if there's not much joy in your life right now, think of what will bring joy into it. Um, Diane and I love dancing, for example. We haven't done much. We must do more of that. Um, now, Diane, my wife, I have to say, she refuses to come in that boat with me. <laughs> but there is... <laughs> There is a reason for that. Uh, when we were much, much younger, I took her out on a date in my yacht, that, that yacht, and um, we were sailing in the Rangatoto Channel and at high speed, and we canned out. No problem. I'd done it many times before, but Diane hadn't. She was terrified. And uh, her enthusiasm for sailing <laughs> diminished, <laughs> I have to say. Okay, she was very scared for some reason. Okay, back to my message. Luke 6, verse 22 says, Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. 
Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Wow. That's an extraordinary statement. Thank you, Roger. And I've lost my place. Oh, here we are. Um, it indicates that when times are tough, we are to intentionally stir up joy. Why? Again, it's because when circumstances conspire to drag us down, we can, through Christ's promises, overcome the spirit of heaviness. And I'm going to ask Heather to come up now, and she's going to read you from an inspiring book, um, a short passage about um, two women. How many of you have read The Hiding Place? Many of you. Written by Corrie Ten Boom. And Heather's going to read one of the experiences that Corrie had in Ravensbrook concentration camp. Right. Corrie was incarcerated with her sister, Betsy. Corrie, she said excitedly, he's given us the answer. This is Betsy speaking. Before we asked, and as he always does, in the Bible this morning, where was it? Read that part again. I glanced down the long dim aisle to make sure no guard was in sight, then drew the Bible from its pouch. It was in 1 Thessalonians, I said. We were on our third complete reading of the New Testament since leaving Shiverin, Shiverin, well, Sivingen. In the feeble light, I turned the pages. Here it is. Comfort the frightened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. It seemed written expressively for Ravensbrook. Go on, said Betsy. That wasn't all. Oh, yes. To one another and to all. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Jesus Christ. That's it, Corrie. That's his answer. Give thanks in all circumstances. That's what we can do. We can start right now to thank God for every single thing about this new barracks. I stared at her, then around me at the dark, foul-aired room. Such as, I said, such as being assigned here together. Oh, I bit my lip. Oh, yes, Lord Jesus. Such as what you're holding in your hands. I looked down at the Bible. Yes, thank you, dear Lord, that there was no inspection when we entered here. Thank you for all the women here in this room who will need you in these pages. Yes, said Betsy. Thank you for the very crowding here, since we're packed so close that many more will hear. She looked at me expectantly. Corrie, she prodded. Oh, all right. Thank you for the jammed, crammed, stuffed, packed, suffocating crowds. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy went on serenely, for the fleas and for... The fleas? This was too much. Betsy, there is no way even God can make me grateful for a flea. Give thanks under all circumstances, she quoted. It doesn't say in pleasant circumstances. Fleas are part of this place where God has put us. Make it, make, Psalm 100 says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. We're called to minister to others in faith and love with a positive attitude. We are most certainly not to serve the Lord with grumbling or without passion. I mentioned that Jesus was a real enthusiast. So was Paul. The word enthusiasm comes from the Greek word enthusios, which means God within. 
Since it's the Holy Spirit that is within each Christian, I think it is likely that we too should exhibit enthusiasm in our Christian walk. Enthusiasm is really catching. We're fortunate enough to have a number of enthusiasts here in this church. I would like you now to point to someone near you that is an enthusiast. <laughs> There's a lot of them here. It's, it, we are so fortunate to have so many enthusiasts here. And that's a gift from God. That's a gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Rejoice always. When we're in, encouraged to be joyful, when are we encouraged to be joyful about our Lord? Always. Not on Sundays only. When we feel like it, no, always. I imagine that each of us can think of someone like this, someone who's bubbling over. Their love of the Lord bubbles over and they are constantly giving thanks. Again, we aren't all extroverts in this way, but with the help of God's Spirit, we can, we can achieve extraordinary things. Gentleness is spoken of. Gentleness, another word is goodness. Our goodness to others should be evident. We're not to hide it. Why? Isn't this showing off? Isn't being good all the time showing off? No. This gentleness referred to is Christ-like consideration for others. It's not boastful. It's a quiet goodness that stems again from having the Spirit of God within you. It's part of the essence of who we are. We see this gentleness in many of those who are our friends or our loved ones. I'm sure you can picture those gentle people in your own life. The Lord is near. He's coming again, you know. Be ready. Continue to do good daily, for he may come at any time. Never give up on doing good. Don't be anxious. Worry is often self-centered, and it's the opposite of what comes next in this passage, which is prayer with thanksgiving. Try it the next time you find yourself worrying. Try giving thanks for all the great things that God has done for you and which he has promised he will do for us. It is a great antidote for anxiety. Another personal experience number of years ago now, um, my wife Diane wanted to go to Romania to work in an orphanage. I did not want to go. And she spoke to me for literally years about doing this. I did not want to go to Romania to work with orphans. <sighs> One day I was walking along the beach at Snell's Beach and um, I had started praying about this thing, this thing that Diane wanted to do and I didn't. find it so difficult. I said to God, what can I do if I go to Romania? What can I do for these kids? And he told me, love them. That's all. 
That's all I heard. It wasn't audible. Just that impression. You can love them. Not an easy decision to make because I had a business at the time and it would mean turning my back on the business and going to Romania for a period of time, working in an orphanage. Um, still didn't want to go, but I got that same confirmation twice more in the next two weeks. What can I do? Love them. Well, when you get that sort of prompting, you, you have to do it, don't you? Anxiety is a huge problem for many people. We worry about our finances, about our children, about our health, about our government, about the future. You know that one, one of the main sources of worry, where worry comes from? It's hairy legs, Satan the devil, whatever you want to call him. The devil, he comes to steal our joy, to deceive us, to speak lies into our minds. These lies are inconsistent with the promises of God. And we all know, if we do read our Bibles, what some of those promises are. Some people go around with a book of them in their pocket all the time so they can take them out and look up a promise. Again, quite helpful if you read your Bible because they're all there. Let's pause for a moment. I'd like you, each one of you, to recall one of God's promises that has meant a lot to you. And because we're a big group, I just want you to speak that promise to somebody near you so they can hear the promise that God has given you to sit, share with them. Go ahead. Now, we could continue for the next half an hour in this vein, but I'll call it a, st a stop there um, because the next item is petition with thanksgiving. We are to let God know what we want. Why? After all, he already knows what we want. Why? Because we, he tells us to do so. Talk to God each day and share your hopes, your fears. Make your requests known to him. But don't just recite a list of what you want. Do it with thanksgiving for what he has already done. Each of us is so blessed by what God has done and is still doing for us. And then there's the peace of God. It's a peace beyond comprehension. It's an inner peace with God. It's a peace we grasp when we know our sins have all been wiped away, forgiven. It's a, it's a tranquility that we can know when we are at one with God. It's a blessed assurance that we are loved by God and our future is assured. You remember that experience I spoke of in Romania? That's what I received when I walked on the beach. Peace. Absolute assurance that he was with me. A peace that passes all understanding. And having had that amazing personal experience of God's love on a number of occasions, I know that I'm truly blessed. Put your hand up if you've received that joyful gift from God. Wow. That's good to know. Finally, brothers, whatever is pure, 
whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So be it. Amen.